Just like we talked about risk factors before, there are also protective factors that can protect us from suicidal thoughts. Protective factors are things that help our mental wellness and help put a buffer between suicidal thoughts. Just like we can have our own protective factors, we can also encourage protective factors in other people's lives. First protective factor is healthy relationships. It's important for us to grow and nourish our relationships in our lives to have those connections that we are seeking. One thing that's awesome about healthy relationships being a protective factor is that it can help you, but it can also serve as a protective factor for the other person in your life. The second protective factor is seeking effective clinical care. There's no shame in going to see a therapist, and we highly recommend going to see a therapist even when things are going relatively well in your life. The third protective factor is having positive life skills and knowing how to cope with life's challenges. We all have hard days and we all have big emotions and being able to know how to self-regulate can help during these times. It's also very important to practice these different skills when things are going well in your life so that when you might be having more of a rough day, you can recall these tools to help you through those days. Having positive self-esteem and a purpose in life are also protective factors. If you feel like you don't have a purpose in life, find one. Find a new hobby, find a relationship that is important to you. We all can find a purpose for our life. I've struggled with depression and anxiety. I felt pressures from the outside world that necessarily weren't there, but I felt them. And because of feeling them, they were real to me. And so after high school, one of the things that I did is I joined the Marine Corps. I thrived in that environment. It was very structured. I got into the best physical condition of my life and uh, felt very confident and transformed when I came out of boot camp. And so one of the things that happened uh, afterwards, I became attracted to a girl that had a different set of standards than I did, but because of decisions that I made in that relationship, I surrendered a lot of my self-respect and abandoned my values, I guess you could say. And what happened eventually is I went to that girl's apartment one day just to grab something and found her in bed with another man. And so that was a tipping point for me and a trigger. And I remember that later that afternoon, I called my psychiatrist. How are you doing? I'm having a rough time, but I'm doing really good. It's nothing you need to worry about. And then I went downstairs and I talked to my mom, gave her a great big huge hug. Mom, I love you. And I'm so grateful for everything that you've done for me. I got into my car and I drove at 80 miles per hour into an underpass cement pillar, dead on. Totaled the car. But the only thing that I had was a scratch on my head and a bruised knee. That was it. And so, of course, I was taken to the hospital and my heart was breaking. And of course, you know, I was in shock because of being in such, feeling the trauma of what I'd been experiencing. And I remember being in the hospital and that girl came to me uh, to visit me in the hospital. And she was really, really mad at me. She said, how could you do something so selfish as to try and take your life and hurt everybody else around you. And that really, really hit me. So the Marine Corps saved my life. I took all of the techniques and the training that I had received in boot camp, the physical training and the mental training, and I applied it. I got up and I ran five miles every day. I did my push-ups and my crunches every day. I really focused on therapy and focused on uh, 
um, building my spiritual life and my connection with my parents on a daily basis. Until it came to the point that I had another bad day uh, with the same girl. It was in the evening time and I was probably 30 miles away in a different town, 30 miles away from home. And I got done talking to this girl and I walked into 7-Eleven, grabbed a styrofoam cup, I went to the gas pump and I filled that cup with gasoline. And then I crossed the street and I drank it. And gasoline, it doesn't go down like you're drinking liquid, right? Like you're drinking water. When I drank the gasoline, it absorbed immediately into my system. It just absorbed into the skin and the tissue. And normally, when something like that happens, what they do is uh, they give you charcoal to swallow so that the charcoal will absorb the gasoline in your system. But anyway, the ambulance came to get me. And again, uh, I went to the emergency room, went to go and get my stomach full of charcoal and then to get it pumped. But it was determined for one reason or another that I didn't need to take the charcoal and I didn't need to have my stomach pumped. So there was another suicide attempt that I committed. I really wasn't physically hurt or became sick. I dealt with a lot of anger. After my first suicide attempt, I was very, very angry that it hadn't worked. And on the second attempt, I was mad, but then I felt stupid too, right? Because I was giving that person too much power in my life to make decisions that ultimately only hurt myself. There's an old saying that says, resentment is poison you can drink, hoping that you'll hurt somebody else. Right, and it just doesn't work that way. After the second attempt, uh, we decided that I needed some outpatient therapy. Now, I was dealing with depression and these suicidal tendencies, but the group that I went to, uh, they didn't really know where to fit me in, and so they fit me into a 12-step group, and most of the people in my group were addicts. I was so excited to learn about the 12 steps. I went to NA meetings. They made all the difference. There is complete paradigm shift there. It transformed me. It changed me. It made a huge difference in my life. But just going to a place, being able to open up and share, knowing that you're not going to be judged, that other people can relate to you and that they'll give you a hug, you know, and tell you to keep coming back, right? Just made all the difference, all the difference in the world. In the morning at home, after my suicide attempt, first thing I did was got up, I put on my stuff, and I went for a five mile run. And the great thing about this run was that in the middle of the run, there was this gigantic hill. And so I'd go along, I'd do my running, I'd be doing really good, and then I knew I had to face the hill. But that helped me so much, right? and gathering my own strength, my belief in myself, my self-discipline, pushing myself. I'm gonna get up that hill without walking or without stopping, you know, being true to myself, right? Saying, this is the way that I plan to do it and this is the way I'm going to do it. And I did it, but I tell you the toughest part of that run was not going up the hill. The toughest part of the run was after I had come down the hill the second time and I was maybe a quarter of a mile from home. My body was gassed, right? And this is where it took the guts and the self-discipline, the structure to say, you're not gonna stop here, you're gonna make it all the way home. I learned a lesson every single day, right? That I ran the hill and that I came home, you know? I was able to leave home faced tough obstacles, come back, didn't quit, gave my all, right? I wasn't focused on the girl. I wasn't focused on how bad I felt for myself, right? 
I was focused on completing that run and making it home. It took discipline and structure to get up every single day. I had to get into a routine. But once I got into a routine, I fell in love with it. I think pretty much in most cases, suicide survivors are misunderstood. My oldest daughter was suffering from depression and from anxiety as well, and had been cutting, and was really teetering on making a decision as to whether she was going to end her life or not. She had had a plan, but I had sense of it before she could put the plan into action. And so I left West Valley, I came to Logan, to USU, and I told my daughter, I'm taking you home. And so she got in the car with me and we talked on the way home, but most of the time I just let her talk. I let her talk things out and I just listened. But I do know that dropping everything in order to go and be there with my daughter and to help her through her pain and trauma, to help her step away from the edge, definitely made a difference in her life because she's still here. For those who may have a loved one that are struggling with thoughts of suicide, remember that the person is suffering extreme pain and grief. In many cases, we may not be able to understand the source of that suffering or why the suffering is so bad. But one of the reasons I believe that people suffer is because they love the people in their lives so much and they don't think that they're worthy of those people. Please don't make light of their situation. Take things at face value. It's also important to assure your loved one as best as you can that you're not going to abandon them. It only takes one person to make a difference in someone else's life. Do all that you can to maybe be that one person. Some things that you can do are also connect someone with resources within your community. It's also important to be mindful of your own protective factors and do all that you can to keep yourself mentally safe.